<laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, in fact, I mentioned to Chess this uh, talk is inspired by his challenge for a big debate more than 10 years ago. And uh, uh, so I'm going to go through many of the things relatively quickly because lots of introduction and many of the concepts have been introduced by uh, you know, very uh, elegant speakers of yesterday. And uh, I may have missed many uh, your, of your favorite slides and, uh, uh, and uh, mis uh, given miscredits to various people. Uh, if so, please forgive me. And uh, uh, you're amongst uh, equally famous people. Um, so, and um, uh, here are the observations. And uh, so you can already see in radial velocity transits and uh, uh, also microlensing is actually opening up our eyes in terms of statistics and uh, uh, in terms of uh, what are there. And the, probably the most important aspect is that, in fact, um, we're starting to uh, come up with a picture that uh, uh, super-Earths are extremely common and, uh, uh, and gas giants are you know, somewhat uh, uh, lower in abundance and may, there may be a factor of three or so. And also that uh, planetary architecture is very diverse. Okay, here are some of the big pictures I'm gonna try to address, and uh, how did super-Earths form so prolifically? They form around stars with different masses and different metallicity. They have masses comparable to what we assume to be the core of gas giants. So in the attempt to come up with a theory to form gas giants, and uh, you must keep in mind that super-Earths are there, and they're very common. Why is the emergence of gas giants so marginal? And how did planets establish their structural diversity? And how did planets, planetary systems acquire their observational, uh, observed kinematic uh, uh, distribution? How did multiple systems attain metastability? Um, so here is the picture of core accretion and uh, you have already heard quite a bit discussion about, I'll go through many of these processes from here to here and in a relatively quick fashion. And uh, here is the classical picture um, as of uh, when I was a graduate student, namely uh, there these minimum mass nebula in the, with the concept that the planets are found where they are formed. And uh, so you can reconstruct uh, the distribution of uh, building block material in this original uh, system by looking at, by augmenting the uh, chemical compositions of stuff that you can find in the solar system. Now today, we have advanced considerably and to really overthrow this old paradigm with a new, uh, new shift. And here are some of the challenges as, uh, that pave the opportunity for us to change our thinking. And uh, so I'm gonna go through each one of these challenges as we go along. First is this question of uh, grain, the centimeter, meter size uh, barrier. People have already talked about, Andrew and uh, uh, Richard has already talked about this business of uh, hydrodynamic drag and things can migrate in from large distance into small uh, region close to the neighborhood of their host star, uh, and then they get lost. However, uh, here are some recent work uh, by Jixin Li, and uh, that they don't actually all get lost. There is a robust uh, last stop coffee shop, and that last stop coffee shop is actually near the magnetosphere and in the inner boundary, and uh, where you can have uh, the possibility that these grains may stop uh, in that location because the, there is a pressure maxima always here, global pressure maxima, so whatever material gets here may get stopped. However, this is not always the case that you can stop because the size of the magnetosphere depends on the magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic field strength and the accretion rate. In the early stages, uh, the accretion rate is so high that this is not a stopping place, and most of the heavy element goes into the star. I want you to keep in mind 
90, more than 95%, more than 97% of the heavy elements in the solar system is in the sun. So if you do things by making the retention too efficient, then the whole star gets starved. So uh, you have to come up with a uh, hypothesis why this can only happen during the late stages. Now, one possibility is that if the magnetosphere, in fact, extends beyond the dust sublimation region, and then you can accumulate stuff near here, and they may be able to coagulate. However, they may also uh, collide with each other. We already heard about the kilometer size barrier because they tend to collide and fragment. Uh, and then the question is, uh, would that be a problem? Well, there's a lesser of a problem near uh, this uh, magnetosphere because the uh, relative velocities uh, relative to capillarian velocity is actually minimized, and uh, so it reduces this collision frequency. But that's not really the solution. Nonetheless, even with that reduced uh, efficiency, you can see the growth of size distribution can still uh, uh, reach a asymptotic limit. However, these fragments, even though they may undergo collisional fragmentation, they have nowhere to go. And they stop near this region. And here they accumulate until gravitational instability can set in. This is how you can set the first and uh, uh, first uh, protoplanetary uh, planetesimal and embryo. And uh, uh, these materials tend to be very refractory, but they can grow indefinitely. And how, what is the limit of their growth? And the concept of isolation mass have already been talked about before. And this idea, isolation mass may lead to uh, the emergence of oligarchs. And the idea here is there are some simulations. And basically, uh, these oligarchs empty out uh, a region that is a few times their Hill's radius. And from that, uh, if their velocity is damped uh, by the presence of the gas and uh, they no longer reach each other and uh, so they tend to get into this limit. However, the isolation mass is proportional to surface density to the three halves power. So in this region, if you have continuous supply of material here and the isolation mass can grow indefinitely. So our old concept of minimum mass nebula with a given power law distribution of the surface density perhaps need to be modified. That in fact, there are regions where it rains on half the Hawaiian mountain and gives the other side a total desert. So, um, and that process and is related to this idea that eventually you can overcome this uh, this uh, um, isolation mass. Here is just a description of why you can get isolation mass. So the next step is that that's the first one you form. And why should you have all of these uh, supers everywhere else? And you re rely on what uh, Richard Nelson has already talked about yesterday, this idea of um, type one migration. And uh, he talked about the two different type of torque that can lead to uh, uh, migration of the planets because the planets interact with the disk and you have the limbla, differential limbla resonance and you have co-rotation resonance. He already talked uh, very um, comprehensively about um, exaggeration, about the dependence on the surface density. And he had a diagram which is very similar to this diagram except uh, the color is reversed. And many of these problems, people have common ideas. They are working on very similar ideas. And, uh, uh, but sometimes they have different representation. Here, the red represents your outward going migration. And the blue represents inward migration. Uh, as a, um, if you imp impose a disk structure, because this depends on the disk structure, such as uh, the uh, logarithmic gradient of the surface density and temperature, and as Richard has described, and you can summarize everything in terms of one particular coefficient, and you can plot out that coefficient, which is a function of this structure. And if you just take uh, the ordinary 
you know, alpha disk model, you'll find that regions where things are viscously heated and there is a possibility of outward migration, whereas in regions which is uh, irradiated, they tend to go inward migration, but then there is a mass range. Here is a semi-major axis, here is a mass range that you can have exaggerated, fully exaggerated torque to enable you to move out. So that sets up the location of so-called trapping radius, where there's a transition between the irradiated and uh, viscously heated region. Of course, if you put in more complicated uh, heating mechanism, as uh, Catherine Crickey has done, and you will find that this region can get extended to much more, much larger mass range. And these include things like layer decretion. Okay, so then the question is, what happens when you have this migration? The first thing that will happen uh, is that that the embryo that you form very close to the central region has a tendency to migrate outwards and they will uh, move outwards and they will clean up whatever material there is in the inside. Perhaps this is the reason of the diversity that half of the planetary system we see have no super-Earths around them. Half of them do have super-Earths with, uh, with um, periods down to a few days, weeks, and months. And, uh, and that difference with the solar system, it is uh, inside the orbit of Mercury, is as clean as you can find. Okay, and why is that cleanliness? Uh, it may be related to this uh, migration of the first generation uh, embryos. And, uh, and, and this can actually sweep or not sweep, depends on the damping of the gas uh, in the sur surrounding region. So this tend to move out to this region uh, where you have a transition between viscous and irradiated region. Now that must be a function of the accretion rate. So hence we link here uh, with observation of disks and her, where we, what we heard about yesterday. So the next step is how do you achieve diversity of planetary architecture? And uh, so here is uh, one possible se sequence of simulations. And clearly, uh, the disk structure depends on the surface density distribution uh, and the temperature distribution depends on the accretion rate and the mass of the central object. And what you will find is that here are the columns with accretion rate of 10 to the minus 8 solar mass per year. Here, 5 times 10 to the minus 8. Here is 10 to the minus 7. Here is 2 solar mass, and here is 1 solar mass, and here is 0.5 solar mass. Now, uh, for the low accretion rate, regardless of the central mass, there's a tendency for them to migrate into a convoy of resonant um, uh, embryos, and they stop this uh, coming towards each other any further. But for systems with high accretion rate, and they can come together and they can cross each other's orbit and they can scatter and even merge. Whenever you see a dot like this, is when they merge. So you will see that the difference between rows are relatively small, but the difference between columns is quite big. So what is going on here? And what is going on here is that uh, in this particular uh, region, when you have low M dot, and uh, that means the surface density of the disk is low. And, uh, and when they converge together, they converge relatively gently. So this is kind of like taking a couple of eggs underneath a shallow bowl, and you row it together, and they gently come down to the bottom of the bowl, and they preserve each other's identity. They don't break the shells. However, if they come together very fast, this is like squeezing the grapes, and then you get them merged, and then they lose their identity to become larger. Um, so this idea requires this combined concept of migration and resonant trapping. The idea of resonant trapping is not strange uh, concept in the solar system dynamics. We see it amongst the Galilean satellites, uh, and we see it amongst the outer solar system. So in the idea of the Galilean satellite, 
is uh, angular momentum is transferred to IO, and IO goes to Europa, Europa to Canami. And, uh, but when they get relatively, this is due to tides, and when they get onto resonance, and they interact with each other, causing uh, each other's, causing uh, energy and angular momentum exchange between each other. And the time scale for that is characterized by the libration time scale of the periastron, longitudinal periastron, and the phase. And so you can see in here, you can see some of this kind of illustration here. So if the migration is faster than the time scale for this response exchange of energy and angular momentum, then you can overcome the resonant barrier. And uh, uh, one of the people who first uh, came up with these concepts was Poincaré, who tried to understand uh, the chaos of solar system, stability of the solar system, by looking at how they can come, you know, you can have overlapping resonance, the possibility if they come too close together, you can have overlapping resonance. This is kind of like a, a few jugglers who are trying to do many things at the same time with different frequency. And when that small perturbation comes along and they get uh, perturbed and they will make a mess because that these different frequencies start to overlap and they will start to cross each other's orbit. Now, so what happens when they cross each other's orbit? Remember that this is semi-major axis, this is mass range. You get into this region, if they can converge from the outside, uh, you come in, the inside goes out, and if they can overcome each other's resonant barrier, and then they can scatter each other. Now, when they scatter each other, in general, uh, they will change, exchange energy and angular momentum sufficiently. There's a tendency for their semi-major axis to spread in the absence of gas. If you have no gas, and when you uh, start to form a very compact region, and they will undergo very dynamical interaction, and uh, here is a semi-major axis, here's the time, and they will spread out, okay? And that is not a guarantee for a collision. However, in this region, if you get spread out, the guys get spread out to the inside, will start to still come back here, and the guys get spread out outside, will come back here. So this process is repeated. This is kind of like, kind of like a group of skateboarders uh, who goes down to half pikes. When they go up and they come back down, when they go down, they go back up. And when you go through enough times, these skateboarders uh, will collide. And uh, Andrew Uden had a personal experience of this type of incident. <laughs> um, and when they do collide, um, and uh, what happens is that uh, here are some of the simulation done by Shang Fei Liu uh, with a complex equation of state and uh, finite difference method. And you can see that the possibility of devolatilization and um, um, and you can actually uh, examine in close details the different compositions, and hence uh, you can work out why some super-Earths, when their mass is less than five solar masses, they tend to follow these mass-radius relationship relatively closely, but others would have very diverse uh, mass-radius relationship, something that Angie talked about yesterday. So um, then we want to talk about the possibility of gas accretion and, um, uh, and onset of uh, gas giants. And we also heard about this classic work that's done by Pollock et al. in uh, 90, 1996. And the idea here is that when you have material accreted in here, and then uh, when it's surrounded by an envelope, the heat is deposited here, and that heats up this envelope so in order for, you, for the envelope to collapse, you have to have the heat to go out. Now, most part of this envelope is made of uh, really, relatively uh, dense gas. So convection is a very efficient way to transport heat out from here. However, in the outer region where it eventually you join onto the disk, and that region should be very low density, and the density of the disk, and uh, then convection becomes inefficient, so you rely on radiative transfer process. 
But the trouble is the flux of radiative transfer goes as one over the density, whereas accretion rate goes as the density. And therefore, it is kind of like trying to drink beer. And at the same time, you're trying to have a beer drinking competition because the beer needs to go down, but the air needs to go up. And so there is a clash, a traffic jam, and that can uh, limit this, uh, this growth rate. So many people have tried to do uh, many things with it. Uh, let me go back. Uh, what did I do? Um, many th people have tried to figure out a way to overcome this business, okay, by reducing the, uh, the opacity, so therefore you can get things uh, uh, transferred much more efficiently. And there are also attempts to understand it in terms of disks, and so they, uh, radiation can go out from uh, the uh, uh, direction normal to the disk plane, and then material can come in through the disk plane. However, I said there's absolutely no reason for you to try to bypass this barrier. And the reason for that is because there are plenty of super-Earths whose mass may, be, may even exceed 10 Earth masses. And if there's anywhere that you have more efficient energy transport is in the inner region close to the whole star, but not out at 5 AU. And therefore, any attempts try to solve the problem of Jupiter formation at 5 AU, you get into bigger trouble at 0.05 AU. And so you must keep the big picture in mind. So what is going on here? So what is also very important is why didn't many of the super Earths turn into gas giants? And one of the reasons we're trying to do uh, with Huber Carr is trying to look at detailed radiation transfer process here. And that requires considerably uh, uh, attention to how the radiation is transferred. So in this proximity, and uh, both uh, uh, Huber and uh, Chris O'Mell has found that perhaps in this region that uh, there is uh, energy being brought to the proximity of the core as well as energy being removed. And that is work ongoing. Okay, so let me try to convince you that the availability of building block material is not the essential ingredient for forming gas giant. Okay, so uh, in fact, uh, when people first observe that when they look at their stellar mass versus frequency of gas giant, and they see this trend, and myself included, we immediately jump to the conclusion, uh, these guys have more massive disks, and therefore, and they're more building block material, and when we put in that, and we produce this kind of correlation, and we're not alone. There are other people who have done the same, and uh, you will be able to generate that with a population synthesis model that you are playing with right now. Okay, and, but this is not a necessarily a good assumption. And when one makes an assumption to make progress, one must remember the weakness of all these assumptions, even though I would argue strongly in front of you, but I would always keep in mind the weakness of each assumption that we make. That is that who says the fraction of mass in the disk has to be certain percentage that of the whole star. And only if you make that assumption, you can generate this, uh, this kind of correlation. So now let's see observational evidence. What do we have? Let's look at the Kepler data. All the data, all of the candidates that has multiple uh, planets, multiple transit events, okay? And here, Bebe Liu prepared this uh, plot. Now here is uh, the mass of the individual planets. And here is the stellar mass. Now this mass, you measure size. So we have to convert it with a mass radius relationship. There are some uncertainties here, okay? But whoever's law, NG's law, or, um, you know, Lissauer's law, or whoever law, we can, we can use this. We can use this and to generate this. Now what you will see right away, here's 10 Earth's masses, here's one solar mass. Right? And there's as many super-Earths around low mass objects as there are high. And there are some that's, you know, there's a tapering off around this region. Okay? 
Now, let's do something further. All of these are in multiple systems. What if I add up the total mass of the planets around an individual star? I plot the total mass of multiple systems, the total mass around a given star. And you will see there's as many um, systems that has a total mass in excess of 10 Earth's masses. But it doesn't matter, this is a little arbitrary because it depends on the uncertainty of mass radius relationship. However, nonetheless, you see there is no difference between different masses here, okay? There's no difference between uh, you know, 0.6 solar mass, 0.7 solar mass, and 1.3 solar mass. And it's in strong contrast to here. What is going on? And the reason for it is maybe also lies in the clue from observation of protostellar disks. Yesterday we heard some more discussion of this. And in fact, mass of the disk is very difficult to measure. However, accretion rate of the disk is relatively easy to measure. Okay? And here is measurement of accretion rate and for different stellar mass accretion rate. And you see there's a general trend. And this trend tells you that if there's a threshold accretion rate, as we've seen from those uh, uh, panels of diagrams from the experiments we did, then there are a lot more stars uh, with accretion rate sufficiently large to have overcome this resonant barrier if the whole star is more massive. And you can actually do this with almost a semi-analytic type of approach, and you can get this fraction of stars with gas giants and reproduced. Okay. Now, what about uh, metallicity? We heard uh, yesterday about metallicity being important for gas giant formation because the formation of dust grains and uh, through various instabilities depend on it. Now, that may certainly be true. Those processes may indeed be important. However, that is not the determining factor of why gas giants uh, are formed. Because if we look at this well-known uh, metallicity versus planetary radius measurement, we see that only this correlation only goes for the gas giants. It doesn't do anything for the, for the super-Earths. Okay, the super-Earths are in this bunch, and there are as many super-Earths around low metallicity stars as there are around high metallicity stars. Let's do the same experiment again. Let's analyze the data from Kepler again. And here is the mass of the individual planets and versus the ma metallicity of the whole star. Now, these metallicity of the whole star, we have to be very careful to get uh, the accurately measured systems. So there are much fewer systems around here. And you can see there are many systems down here a rich supply of system around low metallicity stars as they are around high metallicity stars. We add up their total mass. Once again, the total mass, there is no real difference between the two regions. So the difference whether you can get these guys or not is not availability of material. It is whether they got their act together. What is it that got their act together? What is the cause of this act? Okay. Now, so you ch look at the difference in these type of simulations, and you say, if I put in different metallicity, and then I will see that the trapping radius changes. And the reason that is that for a given M dot, that the effective temperature of the disk is determined. But the central temperature of the disk depends on the opacity. Okay, so that can change this, but this alone doesn't do it and you need some more, okay? So in here, we add in not only the opacity change, but also the possibility of viscosity change. Now, how does that change? But in here, if you do this change, you can see that in the high metallicity system, they can converge. So how do they change? Now, the reason they change is that, again, it's a weak scenario, but let's use it. And we heard a lot of discussion from Richard about various processes that can suppress MRI, okay, with omic dissipation, with various other things. Certainly, omic dissipation relies on the metallicity of the system, uh, sorry, uh, on the ionization fraction of the system, 
and it depends on various things. Okay? Now, the ionization fraction is determined by the availability of grains because the recombination process occurs on the surface of grains. The ionization occurs maybe on the surface of disks. And the depths of this region where you can have the active region is also regulated uh, by the population of the, of, of the dusty material. So in high density region, and uh, uh, they're more neutral, and therefore the viscosity may be lower, and as a result, you may have this type of process. And you can even get this type of process to occur to, uh, at the snow line, and that gives you an additional enhancement. You can have these type of process, and to produce multiple systems which are widely separated. So put that all in into perspective, and what one finds is that the high metallicity systems can actually cross this threshold uh, region for re with relatively low M dot to overcome the resonant barrier to get sufficiently close that their separation of their semi-major axis become less than five or six uh, Hill's radius, and that's when they start to uh, really strongly perturb each other to overcome this resonant barrier. So if you look at the high metallicity and they cross over at relatively low M dot, low metallicity they come over at relatively high M dot. So it's more easy to satisfy for high metallicity systems. So, but the metallicity of the disk is not the metallicity of the star. Okay? We always make the assumption the metallicity of the disk is the metallicity of the star. They may very well be correlated. There are n number of reasons to suggest there's a dispersion. If you put in that dispersion, you put in the, uh, the mass dependence uh, in the M dot, and you can actually come up with uh, a distribution, this correlation between the metallicity and the frequency of gas giants, and these are normalization factors. You can change them, and uh, they don't need to be that high, and for different masses and different metallicity. Okay, so this is one way to uh, look at the, some of this dependence and try to construct a complete picture. Multiple systems. What happens when the first gas giant forms, and when the first gas giant forms, it's going to perturb uh, the surrounding oligarchs. And uh, uh, the gravitational potential changes very rapidly, and it can excite their eccentricity, and this can cause uh, even if you have a competing gas giant, they may collide. Or if you have a nearby cores, and uh, these cores may get scattered, and uh, some of them may collide with, uh, with this gas giant, and, and hence that you can produce a diversity of internal structure between Jupiter and Saturn. More importantly, some of these guys get scattered uh, out and in, and then in these regions where they get scattered out, migration bring them back in, but this time they can't get too close because there's already a gap forming, so they form in the nearby regions and to give rise to the possibility of subsequent multiple, the course of multiple gas giants. And this may in fact uh, be a, a possible way um, to form even systems such as HR 8799, or it may also be able to have potential to produce the freely floating uh, planets. So um, these type of interaction can be reproduced not only with the embodied type of simulation, but also with uh, hydrodynamic simulation, which was done by Xiaojia Zhang. Um, and, uh, and here is some work that is done by the chairman of this section. So if I run over time, he will forgive me. Um, and uh, he's done this long ago. And to show that when you have multiple systems, you can strongly perturb the structure of the disk. But more importantly, when they do do that, they start to move into relatively stable islands of stability. So when people do a simulation of M body putting an N number of gas giants in at the, you know, on the start. And that's blindly testing the initial conditions. One needs to be very careful that, in fact, um, the fate of planetary system may be 
preordained in the sense of that they already adjusted to islands of stability. So we can look at the crossing time of these systems in the presence of the gas. They lengthen those crossing time by a lot. This is the, uh, this is, uh, the Hughes number and the number of Hughes radius separating the planets. And you can see that when the gas goes away and they start to become unstable, this may be the possibility of giving you a gen gentle distribution of uh, this eccentricity. However, I would say that the observational uh, uh, uncertainty in eccentricity determination remains high and uh, is premature to actually draw any conclusion at this stage. Now, of course, some of them may undergo uh, close encounters of various kind. Um, this is close encounter of the third kind. And uh, uh, so you can actually uh, get scattered very close to the host uh, star. This uh, uh, scattering does not mean that you can produce hot Jupiter because there are some mass laws along the way. Even a small amount of mass laws can lead to escape of this uh, gas giant. And uh, those who, uh, it's not laws, uh, let me move on, uh, may have their envelope eventually stripped and they can evolve from a gas giant into a uh, perhaps a super Earth's core and uh, with very different density. Okay, so the diversity of these short period system, closed in system, may very well be due to um, some of these type of process. Uh, retention of gas giants. We heard about type two migration. And we heard about a lot of discussion of the uncertainty that some people have made, uh, including Willie Cly and. Uh, uh, these migration can lead to resonant, uh, resonant uh, uh, captures. And the idea of migration is because once they open up gap, their uh, migration may be locked to, to the uh, evolution of the disk. However, the evolution of this may have different uh, viscosities. So it depends on the surface density distribution of these viscosity. Uh, Xiao Jia Zhang has done some of these simulations to show uh, various migration rate. Nonetheless, they are high. However, there are occasions at occasions where the surface density may undergo a dramatic change due to the viscosity change. And in those cases, it is possible to store type two migration. Most of the gas giants are out at several AU. And therefore, they must be stored okay, in some way. So one way to store them is to utilize this idea. There may be dead zones here. There may be active regions further out, so the surface density can change. There may also be the possibility that the surface density can change near the inner region because it is no guarantee that, that just because um, you had, just because you had uh, accretion onto this magnetosphere, there's no guarantee accretion will always occur. If uh, during the depletion of the disk and this magnetosphere expands, the co-rotation radius will actually be left behind and uh, so the star will spin faster than the disk on the inner boundary and you can quench this accretion and that process too can leave behind some gas giants in the neighborhood of this uh, uh, proximity of the star. Okay, so multiple systems, rapid and slow depletion. And uh, um, okay, so during the depletion of the disk, the boundary between, between uh, uh, the viscously heated and the irradiated region moves in. As they move in, the trapping radius moves in, um, and uh, they, um, any embedded super Earth will move in with it, and, uh, but eventually it will meet the expanding magnetosphere and it will go out again. Okay? And this type of process may account for the possibility that uh, you see this difference in the period distribution of gas giants versus super Earths. So how does it do it? 
So you can have this expanding envelope. You have things that get trapped here. And uh, um, I won't go into this. Uh, but if you have this type of process, as a uh, disk gets depleted, and uh, you may have migration occurring, and the surface density gradually decrease, and eventually you'll find that uh, this super Earth can actually migrate out again in time. And this process um, can lead to some, um, when you look at this interaction, Zhuo uh, Xiao Wang, who is here in the audience, had looked at uh, the interaction between a uh, dipole and quadrupole uh, magnetic uh, host star and the rest of uh, the system and show that uh, a single and uh, multiple uh, super Earths can get trapped into these regions and they may or may not uh, stay on resonance. So just because they start with a resonant convoy, it does not mean that they will end with a resonant convoy. So what is the observational evidence here? Once again, one needs to have much more data. And the data includes multiple systems around these closed-in regions. Here I plot with all available, um, all available um, Kepler's data. Uh, this is with Kevin Schlockman. And what he did was that he take a system with two, three, four, five uh, planetary systems measure them, uh, their spacing in terms of the hill spacing, look at the distribution function. Now, over here, you can see that there's a drop because of stability. But over here, if this is real, if this is real, it's evidence of convergent migration. Uh, it's very difficult to produce this type of uh, drop off, this peak, if you don't have it, okay? And uh, uh, however, there's a lot of observational bias uh, associated with that. You can do this with different type of observational bias. With radio velocities, you can get it into uh, also some hint or tantalizing uh, hint that the system may have undergone migration. So the question is, are the planets packed, closely packed, like this group of penguins, or are they groupies? And uh, they join together like in these uh, clusters, and the cluster will give you indication and supporting evidence, not the smoking gun of uh, convergent migration. There are other competing physical process, uh, uh, multiple lengths and time scales, which I haven't talk, talked about, for example, sweeping secular resonance and uh, among other things. But I, don't want, I do want to just touch base on some of these incredibly interesting ultra short period uh, close in super Earths, such as some of these are found very close uh, to, to uh, uh, their whole star with less than one day period. So I'm going to focus in on one particular system, uh, Kepler 78, and this system has an eight hour period and has a primary and secondary transit, and the whole star is magnetically active. So that is very much like Io moving through the magnetic field of Jupiter and actually produces a perturbed field and through the motion of uh, a semiconductor over the magnetic field that generates a potential drop which can lead to a uh, current. In fact, on uh, Io, when you look with JPL's imager and uh, you can actually look on the surface of this uh, Jupiter, and in the region where you have the footprint of the flux tube, you see hot spots. What does this do for you? Okay, so this is like uh, you have a potential drop, and you have a finite uh, conductivity on this planet because it is made of solid material, and this conductivity you can work out resistance of this material that gives you a current. From that current, you can work out the ohmic energy dissipation rate and the torque. And it's a Lorentz force that generates the torque, and that the ultimate expanse come from the orbit of the planet. So the planet should decrease a little bit. But it does depend on the conductivity. And you may have a case where it is totally iron, then you have an iron bar moving through with high conductivity, or you have a differentiated surface and uh, with silicates on top, which are semiconductors, and the conductor shrink down the bottom, 
then you'll have equivalent to a wire, and wire with a coating on the, on the outside. This type of process can reduce the current, can reduce the Lorentz force, can reduce the torque. You can then work out the torque versus the maximum torque upper limit. You can determine from observations by looking at, because these guys have been observed for four years, they have only four, eight hour period, so thousands of orbit has been seen, and they can determine the P dot. From the P dot, you can work out a constraint on the torque, and using, oops, using that torque, one can start to measure things like putting constraints on the electrical conductivity of the planet. And in this particular system, we believe we can rule out the possibility that it is mostly made of, uh, on the surface, it is made of iron. And it's probably made of silicates, and so you have a coating. However, you can also uh, predict that the system may even produce its own light uh, because it's an uh, incandescent lamp. And uh, so in next generation of uh, 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 JWST, maybe the observation can be done with multi-wavelengths and to see, get the albedos and get the energy budget. And this type of process can help us to understand the composition better. Now, uh, are there many other systems that has this type of uh, magnetic field? Uh, for Kepler 78, we have this system, but there are other systems. We can start to map the magnetic field of many of these systems, and you can start to get into these type of configuration. When the planet moves around here, it can generate even a hotspot, which may have the same frequency as the orbital period. As you can see, there are many other issues, and uh, some of them I will talk about on Friday, and so I won't go into my injury time now, uh, because uh, uh, Jeff will uh, clobber me. And uh, so we have a system. We get a lot of observation. It's like a blind, for you know, many blind people trying to work out the shape of an elephant. Everyone is shouting at you. As a theorist, I get shot at all the time. Look at me, look at me. And then so I will look at them, and then they will tell me everything I did in the theory is wrong because it doesn't fit their observation. And it's true, there are many conflicting information here. But the important thing is to sort out what is the general trend, what is the exception. In statistical mechanics, all, after all the work that we have done, we end up with two things, the garbage and the dispersion. And that's all we get. And that's what we lead to thermodynamics. So, Planetary science, planetary dynamics is evolving from a deterministic theory into a statistical ensemble. We have a statistical mechanics in the making for planet formation. It's not that complicated in the end. So you can do this with population synthesis approach, and this is developed by uh, Christopher and uh, also by Shigure Ida. And along this way, that it will help us to understand what is not there. The idea is not to understand, uh, make all the prediction that we match, we turn this knob, turn that knob. Many people get that feeling. But along the way of turning knobs, you'll find out that theory gets challenged. What I described to you are all of the challenges to the theory that we now are facing and we're now addressing. We're not happy with producing, reprodu reproducing this picture and make comparison with that alone. We are trying to match the challenge that Scott had posed and making this connection between theory and observation to understand nature better. So let me give the summary in the last minute available. And uh, that planet formation is a robust process. Okay, eight of Earth is one, plus minus one. <laughs> and uh, um, so, and its dy dynamical architecture is diverse, okay? And planetary origin and destiny is determined by the disk. And that is determined not only by the disk or protostellar disk, but the transitional disk and eventually uh, the debris disk. We need to understand this context, evolution context. And the major paradigm shift 
from what I started with by minimum mass nebula model is that migration is the most important key element in determining the ultimate fate, the mass distribution, the period distribution, the diversity of the system of planetary systems. So if there are three things you can take home from this talk that are migration, migration, and migration. Okay, and theory of planetary system astrophysics is relevant to many, many astrophysical contexts. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, the, the scenario I propose cannot be very efficient. In fact, that is probably very low efficiency. But I do have something in the bags, and that will make it much more efficient. And we can actually produce a, uh, fl a freely floating brown dwarf and, uh, and uh, gas giant factory. But before I stick my neck out too far, I'd like to know a little bit more from the observers whether this is really a worthwhile pursuit. I mean, it would be, we, you know, we would do that anyway. In fact, I started to work on that subject when there were lots of freely floating brown dwarfs out there many years ago. And fortunately, 51 peg came in. And then I started to shift all my emphasis, emphasis into this other field. But I'll go back to that work and where actually uh, we would like to produce it. And uh, it's related to binaries. Very good question. Uh, so let me repeat the question. Yes, I was going to do that. Whether the accretion rate matters and uh, especially in the early stages when the accretion rate is very, very high, and uh, whether uh, you will produce, overproduce planets, okay? So as I said from the beginning, I subtly planned it, uh, that the size of magnetosphere does depend on the accretion rate. So if the accretion rate is very high, the magnetosphere collapses onto the star, and the dust destruction uh, radius is actually uh, well inside the magnetosphere radius and the system just can't hold grains uh, and they just undergo hydrodynamic drag goes into the star. So that's where the star gets 95% of its original metallicity. Only at the end when the disk becomes sufficiently low in accretion rate and then the, the cavities start to expand. Okay, and you can do that. Secondly is that in the early days when the disk is so so um, um, massive. Suppose I didn't use my method of producing embryos and uh, use uh, Andrew's method or somebody else's method, and we were to produce a lot of super Earths. But the migration for them would be so fast, they would go into the star, okay? And uh, there's nothing, there's no stoppers. And you can actually produce many of these type of system, and you can show that this would be a problem. And uh, because when you have to keep enough material to form the planets, but you must not make the whole star starve. Okay? Everything went into the star and the planets went through the disk. It's a zero sum game. You make it too efficient, the star becomes metal deficient. Okay. So let me repeat the question, uh, whether there are any uh, direct evidence to support that the gas giant formation is due to this overcoming resonant barrier rather than availability of material, okay? So uh, I wouldn't say there's a direct evidence, it's only circumstantial evidence. The circumstantial evidence is that in the core accretion scenario, which I'm willing to even abandon that, okay? In the core accretion scenario, then what happens is that you have to form the core first. So what I'm trying to say is that core, if I look at Jupiter, you look at some of these other guys, they're typically about 10 Earth's masses. When I look at the super Earth's multiple systems, their total mass is more than that. Their total mass is more than that uh, 10 or even 30 Earth's masses. There's no shortage of material. It's just that they didn't come together. 
And that's the, what I was trying to show you with Bei Bei Liu's uh, plot. That's the argument I was trying to do. But it's no direct evidence. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's supporting evidence. We don't know that. We don't know that. We don't know that. Right. We don't know that. But one way to test that, again, is that if you see multiple systems associated with super-Earths, okay, especially associated with hot super-Earths, and which may even be on resonance with the gas giants. But we don't have those observational evidence. If they are available, I think there would be very good evidence to support that. Huh? I don't need to repeat that, right? Do, do repeat it. Okay. So the question is, uh, what introduced the diversity between the solar system and these, uh, these other systems? And did migration take place in the solar system at all? And uh, because the inner part of the solar system is very dry, the outer part is not, right? And uh, so uh, diversity is a major issue, okay? And so when we keep in mind all of these things, one thing I did try to indicate is that the very first generation, and when you form the very first embryo, that could go out and clear out most part, but not all, because uh, it depends on the eccentricity damping and all that during this migration process. And that's why I showed very loosely those diagram went over very quickly. Okay, now, whether uh, Jupiter, I personally do not believe Grand Tech. Okay, uh, I may be very tactless to say that, but uh, <laughs> uh, I never uh, thought the Nice model is very nice. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, sorry. Uh, again, being tactless. Um, anyway, uh, the point is that whether they migrate or not, this is why. Xiaojia went on to look at some of these systems, that if you had these surface density variation due to viscosity variations, whether you can actually slow down the migration. Because the disk did evolve, okay? There's no question the disk evolved. In fact, in 1986, when I was working on, uh, was 84 maybe, when I was working on uh, migration, and I keep on saying, and Jeff Marty can verify this, I can form Jupiter, but I can't keep it there. And it was my biggest nightmare, okay? Now, because of type two migration, it's not because of fast type one, it's type two, okay? And Richard has highlighted that in his talk yesterday. And we're all trying to work on aspects, how to get around to that problem. Okay, now we have one, possible scenario. It's not the unique possible scenario, and that probably related to the dead zone and viscosity and the surface density distribution and so on and so forth. Okay, so we're still exploring. That's probably one of the unsolved problems. And that's what is so exciting about this field. And we're uncovering, following your example, we're uncovering lots of Pandora box and try to get into it. Uh, uh, we have to move on to the next talk. Sorry. Thank you. Let's thank Doug again. Thank you.